Okay, let's focus. Okay, we're in focus now. Um, let's pray for the Word of God. Uh, if anyone uh, can, uh, Robert or um, Dave or Steve, Alex, Nick, whoever gets to um, unmute first gets to pray for the Word of God this morning. I have no control at this point. So whichever of you guys... Elaine or anyone? Sure, I'll, I'll. Okay, go for it. Dear God, we just thank you for the opportunity of coming and worshiping you today. And uh, we know that you are in our presence. And um, we want to just start praying right now for the camp. And just thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to, to run camp this summer. And just ask, Lord, that you would um, just be with us as uh, the leadership makes plans and whether we get the funding and, and just even how to pick the, the, the 16 kids per week. And uh, just thank you for Cricket and his willingness to, to lead in this way. And we know that uh, the kids will be blessed and so will the leaders. And so we just pray that... Uh, and just look forward to some amazing things. And again, just thank you for Addy and his willingness to serve. And just uh, pray that we learn something from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. So um, it's a new month. It's March. So we are starting a new, a new series, which basically continues the same uh, theme we began right. back in January. So we began back with um, Loving God. And then we expanded up in a lot on loving God and what that means. And then February, we used it to, uh, to focus on loving others, the home edition. You know, what does it mean to, um, you know, what does love look like in the biblical sense in the in, in, in families towards our spouses? We spoke about um, a lot of um, keeping our selfishness in check, for example, or putting the gospel first and doing it all for Jesus. Well, now we're expanding the scope. As, uh, um, as we start March with uh, loving others, loving our neighbors, uh, if I can use, or loving our neighbor, if I can use the biblical term. So, welcome to Baltan Park Church, our online service. It's, uh, we have in the church this um, um, posters, not posters, we have big things on the wall that say, belong, grow, serve as three words to define what we do as a church. And I actually chose to uh, expand a bit. And um, in, my, in the bulletins, when we, back in the day, when we actually had bulletins, by the way, today is one year since the last normal Sunday before the lockdowns back in March uh, 2020. So, yeah, if it matters for any. And so in the bulletin, if you remember, it said um, a place to belong. We are, as a church, a place to belong. We are a place to grow. And my take on this, I said, instead of serve, a place to find purpose. And I thought this was appropriate to remind ourselves of our motto as we're looking at the question of purpose in life. Back in the day, back about a few months ago, I sent an email out and asked for suggestions for topics for this, uh, this year as we study a lot of topical um, things. And one email I received was about What's our purpose in life? And it made me think. And as I thought and more and more, it kind of connected with this, you know. So have you ever wondered what is your purpose in life? Is it happiness? Is it uh, riches? Or maybe achievements? Or world peace? This was big back in the day in Romania. World peace. Or maybe just chicken wings. Whatever um, the purpose is, uh, I have this quote from what is called the Westminster, Westminster Short Catechism which was a teaching for those who are about to be baptized. And it says there that man's chief end or man's absolute highest purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And we kind of covered this a lot in our Loving God series in January, but there's also a verse in the New Testament, which Roseanne just read, that answers a lot about the question of purpose or the question of why. I'm going to read again. Um, different translation but pretty much similar it says this for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them ephesians 2 10. so it says here clearly and simply 
we have been created in Christ Jesus for a reason, with a purpose, and that is for good works, which God has prepared beforehand or in advance that we should walk in them. You know, so basically, if you look at this verse, you know, the good works, you know, whether it's praying or um, giving alms or helping the poor, those things are not optional. It's not something that we may or may not do because it is part of who we are in Christ. And it's one of, the, one of the reasons we have been created. Yes, worshiping God and glorifying God, but also loving others, loving our neighbor, serving our neighbor is part of who we are, Christian DNA, if you want to say like that. So loving others is our life's purpose. And this thought led me to uh, the focus of the teaching today, which connects obviously with what we began back in January, which is the greatest commandment. And I'm going to read um, the whole passage, but I will focus on the second part, or the, if you want, the second commandment of this uh, uh, teaching of Jesus. So let me read from Matthew 22, uh, from 34 to 40. I think it should be on the screen um, in the PowerPoint. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, Sadducees they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's Matthew 22. So, as again I say, we began with loving God, the first commandment, the all-in attitude, the, then the lesson of obedience, the lesson of holiness. The first commandment is essential in our Christian walk. But there is this second part, if you want the second commandment, just as important, which is love your neighbor. It is not a new commandment, as uh, the Jews basically quote a passage from Leviticus 19. I don't think it's on the screen, but in Leviticus it says this, you shall love, sorry, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's Leviticus chapter 19. So in this teaching at uh, um, teaching series at Royal Town Park, I paraphrase this command a bit in, in saying love others. It says love your neighbor, but I said love others just because I just continue to be the flow of thought. You know, we had the love others, the home edition, which we did in February, but now we'll focus, we'll expand our scope to this loving others, the extended edition for the whole month of March. We do this lesson about loving our neighbor, our neighbor today. We'll do something about the one another commandments in the scriptures. That will be next uh, next Sunday. We'll have Pastor Fletcher come back again with uh, a teaching on salt and light, being salt and light. And we'll finish in this month with a teaching on going the, going the distance, I think I called it. Basically, it's about missions. Going the distance, really, it's, I think is the title of that message I have uh, I've started to work on. So... We have a couple of questions we're going to look at today. The first question is this, who is my neighbor? And the second question will be, how do I love my neighbor? Because the answers to these questions matter because they represent that horizontal dimension of the love that God has poured into our hearts. And that has impact all around us. And it does open doors for us to proclaim the gospel. And it is by this kind of a love that we will be known as Christians. You know, people know us as Christians, not, that, not by our dogmas or by our attire or buildings, but by our love. It's in the Bible, it says. John 13, 35. By this, people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So, let us proceed. First question, who is my neighbor? In the same passage, actually same moment in time when Christ is challenged by or tested by a teacher of the law, a lawyer, Jesus Christ uh, then expands a bit when he's asked by the same lawyer, and who is my neighbor? And this is the reading from actually the book of Luke chapter 10. And the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied by this, 
a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and deport, not deported him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and then he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. That was Luke chapter 10 from 29 to 37. So who is my neighbor? This parable basically responds to this very question, truly in the context of Jerusalem of the first century, but uh, there are lessons there for us also. So the first lesson is this, loving others means to bring down barriers. Why do I say this? Think back about who are the people in this parable. We have an unknown man, assumingly a Jew, that was beaten by the robbers and left, left as dead on the road. And then we have a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. The priest and the Levite shared the same, if you want, focus on worshiping God in different ways. Priests deal with, you know, priesthood and stuff. Levites served at the temple. So they both, both categories were involved in the worship of God, especially in the temple. But the Samaritans, what's up with them? Well, since the Jews came back from exile, they found this new, new people in, in, in Israel, that were called Samaritans, were a mixed race of different origins than the Jews, and they were despised as being tainted, as being something that is not even worth touching or talking to. You know, if you remember in John chapter 4, Jesus said he had to go through Samaria, traveling um, um, through that region, and he said it had to go, and that was strange because as in those days, people actually, Jews, as they travel from north to south in, in, in Israel, they would avoid, they would take a detour just to avoid to st even step in Samaria. So if you, hear, if you hear in this place about a Samaritan, that means that was a man who was hated, despited, isolated by those around him in that, in that society. There were barriers amongst them. But this Samaritan, he showed mercy, not to a Jew in distress, but to another human being. So we looked at the previous men in this parable and think about what prevented them from showing mercy. What stopped the priest from showing mercy? What stopped the Levite from showing mercy? Seeing a man that was beaten, that was in the on the road. Well, probably they saw, I don't know, lack of compassion. Maybe seeing too much hurt and too much problems and they just became callous. They were too busy. Maybe they saw blood and knowing that they, if they touch blood and other uh, whatever, they thought they would be defiled and didn't want to be defiled until the end of the day. I have no idea. Bible doesn't say why they avoided the man, but they did avoid that man. There are many reasons that uh, they could have had to ignore and pretend there's just nothing there. They just walked by. My question for us, and it's, it's only a rhetorical question, and please keep it in your mind and ponder about this question. Actually, I might ask you when we finish the sermon and we get to the uh, Zoom social, I may ask you this. So what are some modern ways, sorry, modern day barriers that stop us from loving our neighbor? What are some modern day, modern day barriers that stop us from loving our neighbor? It's a good question to ponder. But let's move on. So that was the question, who is my neighbor? Let me actually expand on this a bit because the list is longer than we normally think. So who is my neighbor? It is people we love and those that we don't really care much about. They both are our neighbor. It is people who are kind to us and those who aren't 
kind to us. They're all our neighbor. It is people that look like me and those who don't look like me. They're all my neighbor. It is those who do good to me and also those who hurt me. They're still my neighbor. They're all our neighbor. Christ's love and grace and care should know no boundaries. Let me read to you a passage from Matthew chapter 5, verses from 43 to uh, 40 something, 48. I'm going to read from New King James translation. It says this, You have heard it that was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet on the brethren only, only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Who is our neighbor? Good question. Think about it, ponder about it, and expand the list the way Matthew 5 expands the list. Not just those that we like, we love, are close to us, are friends of us, but even those that hate us, persecute us, do hurt us sometimes. They're still our neighbor. And the Bible says we are to pour love as God pours rain over the just and the unjust. And it's hard. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But that is what differentiates us from what Jesus says here, the tax collectors. Anyway, let's move on to the next question. First one was, who is my neighbor? The second one is, how do I love my neighbor? And we'll look at some more lessons from this parable and not only from other parts in the scriptures. So how do we love or serve others? We love or serve in different ways as we are made and gifted in different ways. Where do we start? Let's start with this. Loving others means that we see a problem and we do something about it. This Samaritan, he came to that wounded man and he had compassion. He had mercy. And probably the priest maybe had compassion, but he walked by. Maybe the Levite had mercy, but he walked by. The Samaritan had mercy and compassion and he stopped. He stopped and he did something about the problem that was presented to him. It was more than just feelings. It was feelings plus action. To love and to serve your neighbor means that you see, that you care, and that you act doing something. The easiest way to circumvent, the easiest way, the easiest way we circumvent this is by you saying, I'll pray for you. And I'm not here to minimize the importance of prayer. We have, we must pray for people. That's, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But sometimes a practical step means the world to the one who is in distress. So first thing, first way we can love others or serve others, love our neighbor is by starting to do more than just, uh, sorry, by seeing a problem and do something about it. More than just feelings. Actions matter also. Second thing, first thing was see a, see a problem and do something about it. The second thing is loving others means sacrificial service. Look at what the Samaritan did in this uh, parable to, for the man who was robbed and, and beaten. He changed his route. He stopped from his journey and he spent a night with that man in an inn caring for him. So he changed his plans. He changed his route, he spent his resources, he poured wine and oil, not oil, wine and something else, I forgot, um, actually it was oil. And then he paid for his uh, uh, staying at the inn and said, even if there's more expenses, I'll cover them when I come back. You know, compassion ought to stretch us beyond our limits, sorry, stretch us to our limits and beyond. We should not see loving others as only within the limits of our comfort bubble. 
Because sometimes we are we tend to do that. We serve and we love and we sacrifice. Sacrifice. We give as in as much as we uh, we feel that it's comfortable to us. But loving others as Christ did means to go the distance. It means to to go beyond your limits and to sacrifice and serve in a way that pushes your comfort limits. It may mean that you see a need and God said in, God says intervene, and you may have to cancel your vacation plans because of that. It may mean that you are planning maybe to buy a new toy for yourself, a new lens or a new camera. And God says, there's a need over there. And God, and you just take the money, you, you, you save for your own blessing, which is not bad. But God says, serve. And you sacrifice your new toy that you wanted to buy to bless someone else with that money. You know, I'm not going to hear, I'm going to give you like step-by-step -step indications how to spend your life and money. But I'm saying sacrifice is part of loving others. It's an integral part of loving others. God's love and grace and provision for us have come and are coming in abundance. And that is to be our model too, to pour out God's love on, the, on others in abundance. Next step is this. Kind of connects with the first but is this more clearly be available sometimes we get so busy with our life with our problems with our stuff that we forget to look up and look around and we miss so many opportunities to serve and to love because we're focused on our stuff i may have shared this in the past, Anna says, uh, she's not here. I mean, she's upstairs, but uh, she probably uh, confirmed that I've said it too many times. But I have two moments when God spoke to me to serve others. And I said no, because I was busy with my own stuff. One time, coming home from Moldova, from mission trip, uh, heading home, I, I was missing my wife and kids. I wanted to be home as fast as possible. And I drive towards the city, about maybe three miles out of this, out of, outside of the city. I could see the city in the, in the distance. And it was summer, it was like July or August, it was very hot. And I see a man, he looked like maybe 50 years old or so, and he was running towards the city. And I heard this voice saying, stop and give him a lift. But I began to argue with myself, ah, oh, should I, if I stop, it's like, oh man, where, and you know, because I was doing probably a hundred, uh, that's kilometers, not miles, I just, by the time I said, maybe I should stop, I was too far and said, eh, he's too far. And I went on. And I regret even today, I regret the moment, the, that moment when God said, stop. And I said, eh, let me think about it. And then the chance just went by. And the second thing is, I was, uh, I was lost in Budapest, in Hungary, in the capital city, with no money. I have just a little bit of money. Enough money to pay our crossing across the border. Uh, I was, me and my friend... Um, ship from uh, the church in Romania and uh, we made a mistake we didn't buy our tickets where we should when we should have and we find ourselves stranded in Budapest we finally found a minibus that would take us to uh, Romania and uh, we spent everything we had even the money in the in the socks he had some money in the socks which he, I didn't know but he found them and he paid uh, help us paid for the bus and we we're left with like like a couple of like a couple of tunies you know like four bucks or something we had in our pockets and uh, before we head on uh, to the minibus, we stopped and bought some pastries. Uh, we have some, some food. We're hungry. And we hop on the bus and we sit on the, like the back bench with uh, me, him, and one elderly gentleman, probably 60, 65 or so. And um, I was held holding my, it was, a cher I, it was a cherry pastry, I remember today. Uh, and I was holding it. It's like, my precious, you know, and I was so, I was so hungry. And I hear this voice saying, Give half to the guy next to you. And I said, nah, that cannot be God because I'm hungry. You know, and I, pay, spend, I spend my last money on this thing. I'm hungry. That's not, that's not God. So I, I have refused. I, in my mind, I said, no, I'm not. And I just you know, ate the whole thing. And the bus goes towards Romania. And we're about an hour in, we stop at the um, restroom. And um, the guy, the elderly gentleman, just goes, disappears for like five minutes and comes back with this huge loaf of hot bread like freshly from the off fresh from the oven bread he sits next to me and my friend chip and says with a with a gleaming smile says guys do you want some bread i had nothing to eat in three days and this is the first time i get something to eat and i'm so happy i have some food do you want to share with me you know you want to you want a piece i felt so ashamed that god told me 
serve and love this man? And I said, no, because I have my own need and I don't have time for others' needs. And I will never forget that moment. So be available. Lift up your eyes from your problems, your issues, your things, and serve others. Tell God that you are available to show his love to others. And ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and to show you where and whom to serve. And say yes when God says serve. Be available to God and to your neighbor. And then, again, the same line, you know, I'd say, open your eyes and heart to the needs of others more than your needs. Actually, that's what I said before. Anyway, I would say, in a way, it reminds me of Ruth and her mother in um, Ruth chapter 1, the book of Ruth. And the difference between the two of them, Naomi, having lost her husband, throws a pity part. You know, I'm so much worse than you are, it says to Ruth in uh, chapter 1, verse like 12 or 13. I'm so much worse than you are. You know, it's so woe to me. I'm so, it's so bad for me today. And all she could think was to send the, the daughters-in-law away. But Naomi, sorry, Ruth, she lost her husband too and her father-in-law, whatever. And at that moment, she said only one thing. I want to show you love. I want to serve you. Where you go, I go. Your God is my God. Your people is my people. I am one with you. I will not depart from you. Ruth meant her life to be a service to her mother-in-law even though she was also hurting, you know? So she opened her eyes and heart to the needs of others more than her own trials. It is hard to serve and love sometimes. If you, and especially hard if you only focus on your own stuff, your own problems. So again, in the same uh, line with the first, uh, the, the previous thought, lift up our eyes, let's lift up our eyes. Let's lift up our hearts and look around and love others, even if our own problems are not all solved yet don't wait until your problem your life is problem free to start loving others do like ruth be like ruth serve even though your heart is still aching with the loss or pain or whatever it is same thought uh flow of thought learn to put others first let me read to you a verse from philippians chapter 2 verse 3 and on do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility, count others as more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That is Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. So for most of our lives, we have been taught or conditioned by the world around us to love ourselves, to care for ourselves, to put ourselves first. Now, how often have you heard in commercials or ads these words, you deserve this you deserve this it's a lot i'm telling you so my my urge for me and for you for all of us is this let us be biblical or christ-like and even even if it's countercultural, let us put others above ourselves let us serve and love others thinking of them above what we think about ourselves put others first Two more points and I'll be done. Be open to serve in small ways as well as in big ways. Sometimes we, we, the big things attract us so much. You know, there is big expedition to, I don't know, Romania or Moldova. I, I want to go there and be there. I want to donate and, and be involved in that because we feel so much ownership when we, with this great event. And sometimes says, maybe cross the street and shovel the neighbor's driveway. You know, there's some big flashy ways we can do ministry or serve others and some small ways that go away. So go by unnoticed by pretty much every anyone, you know. Learn, learn to serve. Let us learn to serve in small ways and big ways equally, because in the end, we can actually say at this point that love is love. You know, the way you love a person doesn't matter if it's in a big or a small way, as long as that is what God has asked you to do for that person at that one time. Because not every act of love would be worth a Nobel Prize or a TV special. Some would, but not all of them, you know. And some, some acts of love or service will be known by many. Others will go unnoticed, you know. So don't serve just for an Instagram like. Or if, even more, don't serve and then just right next post a you know, selfie of you on Instagram and say, hey, look what I did, you know. I mean, I'm not saying it's sinful if you do that, but ask yourself, why do you do that? Why did you do the act of service? Was it for God or for Instagram-like? 
Let me read the verse from Matthew. Chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. When you give to the needy, do not, let, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that's about hands, not feet. Feet ought to know, you know, what they do, because otherwise fall comes. But anyway, do not let your hand, left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that in your giving, so your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. So just love. Love others. Serve. Bless them. Show them God's mercy and God's provision. Be, the, be God's instrument in their lives. But you don't have to, you know, put it on Facebook. Just do it because you do it for God. And to follow the same thought, last point in my, on my list, remain humble as you love others, as you serve others. Stay humble. You will receive lots of thank yous and, and I love you and, and I'm so blessed. I'm so happy from people around that you, when you serve. You will be blessed by the reaction that you have. And sometimes that reaction might become the main motivator. It's like a, like a high. It's like a buzz. It, you know, you love to be loved and appreciated. I, I get the same thing, to be honest. I love when people uh, come, come to me and say, thank you, or uh, it was so awesome. So, uh, or you, you just, you, you, did, you were God's hand in my life or whatever they say. It's, it feeds my ego, unfortunately. I know we should say thank you. It's not like we don't have to say thank you to people, but we need to stay humble. And since words in the scriptures, above all, guard your heart. Above all, guard your heart. Because there's a temptation to feel good or too good about yourself, and that leads to pride. And that will spoil the very act of love and service. So humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. James 4.10 says that. Do it for the Lord. Do it as unto the Lord, as the scripture says. Because if our focus is God's glory, even in that act of love and service, you will be able to guard your heart and stay humble as you do things for the Lord, not for the praise of people. Matthew says, actually Jesus says in Matthew, that if we do this, acts, acts of love and service, for the applause of people, we lose our reward. Tough words, but real words. So remain humble. So this is loving others, the extended edition. You know, we spoke about, and I, my, all my notes are on the floor, so I'm not going to go back to them. But all these steps, do something, not just have feelings about. You know, action should come with your love. Be intentional, be sacrificial, be available. Do it for the Lord in hum humility. Guard your heart. All the things I've said, I think they're probably on the screen right now. It should be a last uh, PowerPoint uh, slide with all these things together. Yep. You see a problem? Do something about it. Loving others means sacrificial love. Loving others means that you are available and that you lift up your eyes from your own problems and serve others. Next slide. Last slide, actually, in the whole PowerPoint. Loving others means that you learn to put the others first, even though your issues are still there, your problems may be still existing, but you still serve, even though you may have some issues yourself. Loving others means that you do it in small ways and big ways equally with, you know, even whether you're known or it's unknown, it doesn't matter because you do it for the Lord. And above all, stay humble. Serve others, love them, love your neighbor as yourself, but in, the, in this process, give God glory. Accept with humility all the praise that you receive and send them back to the Lord because He's the only one that is worthy of praise. So this was it. Loving others, the extended edition. Hopefully it was a, for many of us, you know, I know our church and I had this thing, I was sitting down on the stairs here this morning and was praying for, for this time and I thought, we have a church, a family at Bridal Town who does a lot of this, you know. Whenever we had a, a need, it was overwhelming uh, support for that. It was food uh, drive for a sick person or money for Moldova or for um, Alex when he went to, um, to New Guinea. No, whatever, New something, New Zealand. Our church knows how to love and serve. And there's no issue there. So this is a good reminder. I have no idea which part of this message touched your heart. But I pray that something did touch your heart and, and moved you towards loving more or loving through God's strength or staying humble. I have no idea which part is for you. But as a practical reminder, I hope that this is 
for all of us, a reminder that this is the purpose we're, we're made for. Ephesians 4, no, Ephesians 2.10 says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared before time, ahead of time for us to walk in them. But at this point, my last thought is this. All of this will remain just theory unless we understand one crucial part of the parable of the prodigal of the of the good samaritan this is it and jesus said to him you go and do likewise you go and do likewise let's pray